we're currently living in the most indebted period in human history. The rapid increase in global debt over the last few years has been staggering, surpassing all expectations. While the general focus is often on government debt, it's important to note that not all debt is created equal. No one realistically expects large, developed countries like the United States, the UK, or France to default on their debt. But that doesn't mean there aren't significant risks associated with the growing debt levels. To truly understand whether a country's debt is sustainable, we need to examine it in the context of its GDP, or gross domestic product, the total value of goods and services produced in a country. This is where the debt-to-GDP ratio comes into play. Debt by itself isn't necessarily a problem. The question we should ask is how much economic output does a country generate in relation to the debt it has accumulated? Let me put this in simple terms with a personal finance analogy. If you owe $50,000 on a credit card, whether or not that's a problem depends on your income. If you only make $20,000 a year, that's a serious issue. You may even be on the brink of bankruptcy. But if your income is $200,000, that $50,000 debt isn't as overwhelming. In fact, you could potentially pay it off relatively easily. The same logic applies to countries. Their debt becomes a problem when their economies aren't robust enough to manage or service it. Generally, a debt-to-GDP ratio of 30% to 40% is considered healthy. At that level, the country has some debt, but it's backed by strong economic output, allowing the government to collect taxes and generate revenue sufficient to cover the debt. In such cases, the debt is sustainable. However, when this ratio climbs to 60%, things start to become more precarious. Under the Maastricht Treaty, members of the European Union are required to keep their debt-to-GDP ratio below 60%. Many of them, including countries like Spain, France, and especially Italy, have exceeded that threshold. This is where governments and economists begin to feel uneasy. But perhaps the most critical threshold is 90%, as outlined by economists Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt. Through their research, they found that when a country's debt-to-GDP ratio surpasses 90%, a major shift occurs. Debt ceases to be productive. The basic economic idea behind borrowing is that it should fuel growth. In theory, if a government borrows a dollar, it should stimulate more than a dollar's worth of economic activity, generating more GDP than the amount borrowed. This is the basic premise of Keynesian economics. However, what Rogoff and Reinhardt discovered is that once a country's debt crosses the 90% threshold, borrowing becomes counterproductive. Instead of generating $1.20 for every dollar borrowed, the country might only see 90 cents or even 80 cents of GDP in return. In other words, at that point, borrowing no longer stimulates growth and the country can no longer borrow its way out of debt. This creates a vicious cycle, or what some might call a doom loop, where more debt leads to less growth, and less growth makes the debt even harder to manage. For perspective, the United States has already exceeded this 90% threshold. Today, the U.S. debt-to-GDP ratio is about 106%, and it's projected to rise even further, possibly reaching 120% soon. This isn't just happening in the U.S. In fact, many developed nations are now facing similarly high debt levels, making the global situation even more concerning. Modern monetary theory, MMT, has been gaining traction in recent years, especially as these debt levels continue to rise. One of the key proponents of MMT is economist Stephanie Kelton. The theory essentially argues that countries like the U.S., which issue their own currencies, can carry much higher levels of debt than traditionally thought because they can simply print more money to pay it off. MMT advocates claim that even a debt-to-GDP ratio of 200% or 300% isn't a cause for concern for nations that can print their own currency, as long as inflation remains under control. But there are major caveats. First, this line of thinking doesn't apply to countries that borrow in a currency they don't control. For example, Argentina borrows in U.S. dollars but can only print pesos. This discrepancy can lead to severe economic problems, including debt defaults, However, the U.S., the Eurozone, and Japan are in a different situation because they can print their own currency. MMT also suggests that if inflation starts to rise, governments can simply raise taxes to cool down the economy. But this idea has its flaws. History shows that relying on higher taxes to control inflation is a risky and often unpopular move. It doesn't always work, and it could create more problems than it solves.
So what happens next? One of the reasons debt hasn't yet spiraled out of control in many developed countries is that interest rates are at historic lows. When interest rates are low, even large amounts of debt don't generate massive interest payments. Essentially, these governments are borrowing cheaply. But that situation could change. If interest rates rise, and they inevitably will at some point, the cost of servicing all that debt will increase dramatically, putting even more strain on national budgets. Some people argue that the central bank's money printing to finance these massive debt levels should lead to inflation. However, we haven't seen significant inflation yet, despite the unprecedented levels of money creation. That's because inflation doesn't occur solely from printing money. It's driven by velocity, the rate at which money changes hands in the economy. When people lose faith in a currency and rush to spend their money, inflation takes off. In the late 1970s, for example, the U.S. experienced a period of runaway inflation. People rushed to buy assets like gold, real estate, and even consumer goods like cars and appliances, fearing that prices would keep rising. This rapid turnover of money caused inflation to spiral out of control. However, right now, we're facing a different problem, deflation, where the value of money actually increases. Deflation may sound like a good thing, after all, who wouldn't want their money to be worth more? But in reality, deflation can be far more damaging than inflation. Japan has been trapped in a deflationary cycle for decades, their economy has stagnated, and they've struggled to escape the grip of deflation since the 1990s. When prices fall, people delay spending in the hope that things will become even cheaper. This creates a downward spiral where businesses make less money, cut wages, and the economy contracts even further. One of the insidious effects of deflation is that it makes debt harder to pay off. Let's say you owe $100 million in debt. Even if the interest rate is low, deflation means that the value of each dollar is increasing. So in real terms, your debt burden is actually growing, making it more difficult to repay. This is what happened during the Great Depression in the 1930s. And it's a scenario that few people alive today have experienced firsthand. Interestingly, while some countries like Japan are grappling with these deflationary pressures, others, like Argentina, are still dealing with chronic inflation. Argentina's economy is often cited as an example of what can go wrong when a country borrows in a foreign currency while facing internal financial instability. The country has defaulted on its debt multiple times and inflation remains a persistent problem. However, it's also a nation with incredible potential, rich in natural resources, a highly educated population, and a vibrant culture. The challenge for Argentina and many other middle-income countries is how to escape the middle-income trap. The middle-income trap is a concept in development economics that describes how countries can grow to a certain point but then struggle to transition into high-income status. They often get stuck relying on low-skill manufacturing and exporting natural resources, but that strategy only gets them so far. To break through to the next level, these countries need to move up the value chain by investing in technology, education, and innovation. In Argentina's case, the question is, why not develop more high-tech industries and move away from just being a commodities exporter? This issue isn't limited to Argentina. Countries across Latin America, as well as in Asia, face similar challenges. Even China, which has experienced unprecedented growth over the last few decades, may find it increasingly difficult to sustain that pace. The easy growth, fueled by cheap labor and massive infrastructure investments, has been achieved. Now, China needs to focus on technological innovation and high-value-added industries if it wants to continue its upward trajectory. This brings us back to the broader global debt problem. Governments around the world, especially in developed economies, have accumulated massive debt loads. In the U.S., for example, the budget deficit for fiscal year 2020 was already projected at $1 trillion before the pandemic hit. Then, Congress passed an additional $3 trillion in emergency spending. While this was necessary to prevent economic collapse, it has pushed the U.S. debt-to-GDP ratio to alarming levels, around 135%. While some economists argue that we can continue borrowing and printing money without consequences, history suggests otherwise. The laws of economics, while sometimes difficult to get right, are ultimately rooted in human nature.
And while human nature hasn't changed much over the past 100,000 years, circumstances do change. If we continue down this path, the consequences, whether through inflation, deflation, or some combination of the two, will eventually catch up to us. In conclusion, the debt levels we're seeing today are unprecedented, whether it's the United States, Japan, or Argentina. Countries around the world are grappling with how to manage their debt in an era of low growth and deflationary pressures. While modern monetary theory offers some hope, the reality is that we're entering uncharted territory. Only time will tell if we can navigate this period of economic uncertainty without triggering a global debt crisis. But one thing is clear. The decisions made in the coming years will shape the global economy for decades to come.